Uh, anyone ever been scuba diving? Um, I've never been, and I never want to go. <laughs> never want to go. I am deeply fascinated by the ocean, but also deeply terrified by it. It's just like feeling another world. So I can understand why someone who wants to, you know, touch that world and see it. But to me, the fear is it's too great. So I'll never do it. One of the dangers about scuba diving, I'm told, is it's really easy once you get underwater to become disoriented and confused. Because you you know, here you got the ground to kind of you know level you out. But as you're kind of descending, you don't have that. There's just you can't see the bottom. And sometimes there are these underwater currents which can pull you away from the group that you're diving with out into the open water. Now, especially if this current is kind of gentle, you may not even notice how far you've drifted away until you come up to the surface. I want you to imagine what that would be like if you were scuba diving and a current has gently pulled you away and you come up and there's nobody there. And there's no land. There's no way you can swim far enough and fast enough to save yourself. You're going to spend the night in the sea, in the void, in the darkness. That scares me to death. The Hebrew writer talks about something. You can imagine that's far worse than that. In chapter 6, he calls it falling away. Falling away, that is, from, from God, right? And unfortunately, we've seen this happen. When someone who has committed to Christ falls away. Well, how does that happen? Well, it's hardly ever an abrupt renunciation of one's faith. In most cases, I would suggest it's a barely perceptible drifting, as if on some gentle spiritual current pulling you out into the open sea. And the question we begin with today is, are you drifting? And if you have any love for God and concern for yourself, ask that question honestly. Are you drifting? Here's our text in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. I just want you to glance up at the previous chapter here. The author of the book of Hebrews has taken chapter 1 to establish Jesus, first of all, as God's complete and final revelation. Verses 1 to 4. God has spoken in various times in different ways. Now he's spoken through his son. And then he spends verses 5 to 14 showing that God's beloved son has ultimate authority. And he, knew, he moves in chapter 2 from exposition to exhortation. From the Christ on, on his throne to our response to his reigning on and you can see that in the way that he starts chapter 2, right? He says, therefore. In other words, everything that he's going to say to us today is grounded in the supremacy of Jesus as king. There's a couple things we want to notice uh, from this text, and then we'll move on to some application. The first thing is the word warning in verse 1. He says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. I think the lesson here is don't lose your focus or else you're going to drift. Don't lose your focus or else you're going to drift. Now the biblical authors will put it in a number of ways. Uh, James in James 5 talks about people wandering from the truth. 
Peter talks about being like strange sheep right, from the shepherd. The image of drifting, as we've already noted, is a very potent one. There are very various currents in our life which can gently carry us away from God in very subtle ways. And we're, when we're not really vigilant and uh, focused, <coughs> then we, we, and we lose our focus on God, then the current is going to take us out. That's just what's going to happen. And so a Christian then can never kind of float through life. You can't just go with the flow. We have to stay engaged. We have to stay intentional on our, on our focus on God and His Word and His will. And so this drifting or this wandering or this straying, however you want to put it, it's not something that's just inadvertent and just sort of happens <coughs> Oops, you kind of find yourself there through no fault of your own. It's not accidental. It's not uh, an unconscious departure from the Christian life. It's a failure. It's a failure of the sheep to follow the shepherd. Right? It is, as Peter says in 2 Peter 2, verse 15, it is a forsaking of the right way. It's letting go, as the Hebrew writer will say in chapter 6, it's letting go of that one sure, steadfast anchor of the soul. If you let go of the anchor, you're going to be cast adrift. So the drifter here is culpable. Now what's the solution that the writer gives? Well, it's right there in verse 1. Snap out of it, right? Pay attention. Not just pay attention. Pay uh, close attention. No? Pay much closer attention. Concentrate, in other words, with all your mind on what? On what you have heard. Well, what's that talking about? He's talking about the gospel, right? He's talking about the message of salvation, which he'll, he'll describe in verses 3 and 4 as being confirmed by God. The message that God delivered through his son, chapter 1 and verse 2. So just as a sheep can stray by losing his sight, uh, losing focus on the shepherd, we drift by losing our focus on the shepherd's word, on his voice. So the gospel is that stabilizing factor in our lives. The gospel is that anchor of the soul. It's what keeps us sort of tethered to God and hope and truth and all that is good. So the implication then is drifting from the word means you're drifting from God. And clinging to the word means that you'll be clinging to God. So there's a great danger here in just going with the flow. We've got to be intentional about our walk of faith, right? We've got to stay engaged. Allowing other people to do the praying, other people to do the studying, other people to do the reading, other people to do the teaching, other people to do the working and the serving and the loving, and just kind of going along for the ride. If you're not clinging, in fact, if you're not growing in that word, you're driven. If you are, pay attention. Pay much closer attention to what you have heard. Now, the second thing we learn is he gives the motivation, the reason for that warning. Verses uh, 2 and 3. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. I think the lesson here is don't neglect God's gift or else you're going to pay. He argues here from the lesser to the greater. God delivered the old covenant message through angels. That was the Jewish understanding. And this message, he said, proved to be reliable. Your version might say something a little bit different. Stable or firm. It was binding on Israel is the idea. Therefore, to, to neglect that word would bring about a sure and severe punishment. Sin wasn't taken lightly. Every transgression, every disobedience received a just, my version says, retribution. Uh, Lawrence's version said reward. The idea is you're paid out for your refusal to listen to God's word. Uh, or a penalty, or a punishment, or something. It, the, the word means a payment of wages. You get what you deserve, is the idea. So God holds us accountable, right, for our response to his voice. Now, we all sin, 
We all fall short of the glory of God. The real question is, what do we do with God's gift of salvation? Because Paul says, now the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the point is, if people under the old covenant were punished for neglecting its message, how much more severe will our punishment be for neglecting the gift of salvation, the free gift of God under the new covenant? It's not as if we're dealing with a different God now that we're crossed over you know, into the New Testament, someone who is less concerned with justice or less concerned with obedience or something like that. If we refuse to listen to the message that Christ delivered, delivered a message of grace, a message of, of salvation and forgiveness, which is a far greater, fuller revelation than what the angels delivered, a message of the law, well, it says that we're really not that interested in being rescued, doesn't it? That's what the word neglect means, to neglect that gift. To neglect something means to ignore it through apathy. Like it doesn't really mean that much to you. So the gospel isn't some sort of cozy blanket that we can kind of put on when we want to. It is a powerful message of God that he delivered through his son that he could save us from everlasting death. And those who care so little about that message uh, that they neglect it, they're going to find, as the Hebrew writer says, no escape from punishment. So the third thing we learn here is he talks about this message of salvation in a little bit more detail at the end of verse 3 and verse 4. He says, it was declared at first, this message was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. And the point here is, this message was declared by the Lord, it was attested, uh, we have you know, multiple points of, of evidence here that it's been confirmed by God. So we ought to pay attention to it, I think, is the point. We ought to be clinging to that. We ought to be not neglecting it, but paying much closer attention to it. And because Jesus himself came to deliver the message. You know, I mean, would you listen to a message if uh, the President of the United States called you? Uh, would you listen if he showed up to your house personally? That's what, that's what Jesus essentially did. He came down from heaven. He came to earth to personally deliver that message in word and in deed. Now, what's interesting about the book of Hebrews is the, book, the, the Hebrew writer, whoever that person was, he wasn't an eyewitness. And neither were the recipients of this letter. They didn't hear the message of the gospel directly from Jesus' mouth. They were like us. They, they got it secondhand. But even though they didn't hear that message directly from Jesus, even though they weren't eyewitnesses, they could still trust it absolutely. Because they could go and talk to the people who were eyewitnesses. They could go talk to the people who had heard from Jesus. And because God had provided undeniable proof of the message's validity by confirming it with miracles. So when the gospel was preached in the first century, it was often accompanied by miracles. And those of you who have read the gospels, you see that Jesus, what does he do? That, that first year or two of his teaching, he's teaching and what? He's doing miracles, right? He's telling the truth and he's showing that it's true. It's like a double, it's like a you know, teaching on two fronts. And the same thing happens with the early Christians. Uh, they, they were given the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And so you had like Peter and Paul and others who would go out, they would preach, and they would do miracles. For instance, in Acts chapter 3, uh, there's a guy who couldn't walk. And Peter and John are walking up to the temple in the hour of prayer, and, and this guy looks at him, you know, like he's asking for money, and, and Peter says, look, at you don't have any money, but what we do have is in the name of Jesus Christ, arise and walk. And this guy, who's never walked, he just, he doesn't just get up and wobble around. No, he's not springing like a deer. He's jumping around in the, in the temple grounds. And, and everybody knows this guy. He's been by this gate, you know, for years. And they think, this is the same guy. And it provides this great foundation for Peter to then preach the gospel. Listen to what I have to say. Because of this miracle, right? He's confirming it. And then Peter and the 
and John get in trouble and they get dragged before the Sanhedrin and they say, you got to stop preaching in Jesus' name. But even those guys in Acts chapter 4, they couldn't deny that a miracle had been done. So all they could do was threaten him and beat him up. Of course, it didn't work. We just kept on preaching the word of God. So um, the point is, God had not only spoken this message of salvation, he had also acted to confirm this message of salvation. And the major point then is, so then all of us ought to pay attention to this, right? God is going out of his way to make sure we have it, to make sure we have every reason for believing in it and holding on to it. Well, we know what the text says. We know what the text means. But how do we apply it? So we want to spend the remainder of our time talking about application. I think there are three things that we can learn. And the first is, we see here in this text a call to commitment and also personal responsibility as children of God. We live in a consumer culture where people are constantly shopping. And I don't just mean for things and stuff, right? They're shopping for ideas and experiences and philosophies and new ways of life. And our idea, our culture's idea of commitment is consumer-based. What do we mean by that? We're committed to something only as long as it fulfills my immediate needs. Right? So we used to shop at Harris Teeter, me and Rachel, because like we could walk to it. So there was convenience factor there. So we shopped there for a while until we discovered legal. You all know about legal? Do you think I cared at all about Harris Teeter after I found legal? <laughs> no, I have no loyalty. Because I'm getting a better deal, right? So we understand what we're talking about. This is okay when it comes to groceries. It is not okay when it comes to space. Consumer-based considerations. Some who wear the name of Christ are like spiritual consumers. And they're drifting from one idea to the next. Or maybe from one congregation to the next. Whichever one best suits their desires, their comforts, in the moment. And so they're going to evaluate an idea. They're going to evaluate a church not by its doctrine, not by the faithfulness of that group, not by their loyalty to Jesus, whether there is love there, but what it offers them. Right? That what it offers the spiritual consumer. How do they fulfill my needs? How convenient is it for me? What programs do they offer my kids? Or whatever the you know, consideration is. Now this isn't to say that you know, there's, we don't personally benefit right, from true faith. We talked about that a little bit in this morning's class. Right? We do. There are tremendous blessings. Uh, personal blessings that come along with serving Christ. But this kind of attitude, this consumer attitude, it ignores this rightful claim that Jesus has staked out on our lives. I'm reminded of what Paul told the Corinthians, who were doing all sorts of terrible things with their own bodies. And he says, you are not your own. You were bought with Christ. You were bought with the precious blood of Christ. So that changes things. Right? He's got a claim on you. So instead of asking, what do I owe Jesus? What do I owe his people? The attitude is, what does Jesus owe me? What, do, what does the church owe me? And then faith becomes mere pragmatism. It becomes a means to an end. And the minute we stop getting what we want, we're going to drift away to something new that suits us. And I think this text stands in the way of that consumer encounter. <coughs> It is calling us to stay committed to something that is above us, that is above my desires, right? It is transcendent. It has a greater authority and claim on us, and that is that message of salvation, that word of salvation. We've got to stay loyal to that. Now, we also lack a solid grasp on the second half of this personal responsibility. Again, you know, this is just kind of a cultural thing that if a crime is committed, we're almost more apt to say, well, why did this person 
factors that, that made this person into the kind of person who would commit this crime. I mean, you know, the blame is maybe on his parents or on his circumstances or something like that. And sometimes this, this kind of thinking can kind of lead into, into the church in the context of our faith. If we drift away or someone drifts away, well, it's got to be someone else's fault, right? Uh, but certainly not ours. We, drift away. we can always point the finger and say, well, brother so-and-so, he was rude to me or whatever. Or there's so much hypocrisy or whatever. And we point to these other things, but we don't want to take personal responsibility. Now, I understand in these kind of cases, there's probably enough blame to go around. Absolutely, right? But let's not miss out on personal responsibility in this event. We're all accountable to God for our choices. The one who stumbles and the one who causes the stumbling, right? The one who's, who's leading others, who's blind, and the people who are following. So I reminded of what the Hebrew writer says in, in Hebrews chapter uh, 4, verse 13. He says, No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It's going to be a, a reckoning. Uh, we're going to be held responsible for our choices. What's the solution? The solution is to pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Let's be great for the gospel is wonderfully good news, but it presupposes the bad news of our sin, right, and our guilt associated with that. If we skew the bad news and we dismiss the concept that I'm personally accountable for my own choices, well, then the news ceases to be good because there's nothing now uh, from which I need to be saved. So we're called to commit to Christ. We're called to pledge our loyalty to him no matter what, no matter what anyone else does. No matter how we feel about it. And if we drift away from it, ultimately, we're going to bear that responsibility like ourselves. That. So you've got to be wanting to pay much closer attention to what we've heard. This kind of brings us to our next point. What is the place of judgment in Christian teaching? This idea of, of retribution that he talks about in verses 2 and 3. And I think this is another area. I'm, maybe I'll, I'll speak for myself here. But where scripture kind of breaks against my own cultural sensibilities, where I'm uncomfortable with these kinds of things about judgment and using the fear of God, right, to motivate faithfulness. If I'm purely thinking on this, this sort of old man, old Jerome mindset, this worldly mindset, I do great against that, right? How can a God who is so full of love <coughs> Punish the objects of his love. How do we reconcile those things? But the theme of punishment for disobedience, which is pervasive in the Old and New Testament, and Jesus talked about it as well, has to do with God's justice and holiness, doesn't it? But it's not at odds at all with God's love. In fact, for God to warn us of judgment, is that not an act of love in itself? The Bible says. God is love, 1 John. But the same Bible, in the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, says that God is a consuming fire. He's both, both of these things simultaneously. So God's justice and His holiness are just as immutable as His love for us. He can never violate those features of His character because to do so would be to violate His own nature. And He would be less than God. He wouldn't be Himself. And God knows that sin separates us from him. It warps our humanity, and it ultimately brings death. So how can a God who is perfectly just, but also loves us, <coughs> not destroy us in our sins? You see the dilemma. And it is a dilemma. There's only one answer. And it's the answer that he gives. It's what we just commemorated. It's where our lives are built. It's where our hope is. It's the great salvation that he's provided for us in Christ Jesus. As Jesus died on the cross, we see God's justice.
the E to give us his life, which is what Randall was talking about. That's the amazing thing. Today he will be with me in heaven. I'm dying for you. I'm dying to save you. To save us from that darkness and that evil and that gnashing of teeth. So I think now that hopefully helps us understand what verse 3 uh, is about. How should we escape? If we neglect that, that's our only means of escape. Right? So there's zero uh, percent possibility of escape. You know, sometimes all we need I think maybe most of the time, for most of us, right? All we need is a little encouragement. But when we're in real spiritual danger, we need a warning. We need to yell at them. You know, a parent sees his or her child drifting into a busy street to get a ball, completely unaware of the danger around that child. What do you think the parents can do? Parent loves the child. Parents gonna scream. Stop, right? Don't go a step further. Turn around. Or else. Right? It's gonna be the end. And hopefully, when that child does listen to their parent, right, they're saved from danger. And there's gonna be a conversation, you bet. There's gonna be a conversation of love, and there's gonna be tears involved, right? I love this passage in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 33, 11. This is God our Father. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Is that not a loving Father? Is that not a just Father? So, let's move on to our last point here. Thankfully, we have more than negative words of warning and punishment to motivate the faithfulness. We have the positive, liberating words of salvation. And this is what, if you look at verse 1, this is what the author points to as the stabilizing factor for Christians. This is what keeps us on the straight and narrow, is our focus, our paying attention to what we have heard. God has gone to extraordinary lengths to get this message to us. Not only to get it to us, but so that it would be confirmed, so that we could rationally uh, believe this message, and we could hold on to it, and we can have a reasonable hope. God, God bore witness to the truth through his miracles. He gave us this historical, authoritative reference point to sort of hang our hat on. And so and Christianity is a historical faith, isn't it? Um, all of its teaching is predicated, predicated on these events actually having happened. Um, for the gospel to be news, let alone good, it has to have actually happened. So we cannot say things like, well, whether or not these stories literally happen doesn't really make any difference because the impact they have on my life is real. We can't say things like that, right? That's not, that's not helpful. Because Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with regard to the resurrection, he says in verse 14, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, from, uh, whom he, he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sin. And by the way, you can forget about all those loved ones who have died believe. Right? So faith in this message is not some blind leap in the dark. It's an informed decision that we make to commit oneself to Christ based on the testimony of the apostles, multiple levels of evidence, the eyewitness proof, and the miracles that were performed. And this is why we can't compromise on this message without a long time. Yes, so where does this land with you? What we need more than anything is God's salvation, just as this recorded here, as revealed by Jesus, confirmed by eyewitnesses, and God's own testimony through these miracles, chiefly through the resurrection. And to drift away from this mess, or to treat it carelessly, as if it doesn't really make that much of a difference, 
That is inviting spiritual religion. On the other hand, if you pay much closer attention, I mean even closer attention than you're giving it right now, if we have a devotional relationship to this word, and we read it every day, and we pray through it, and we share it with other people, and we live it out, that means we can go through life with all of its trials, all of its hardships and disappointments and loss that we endure with a confident, reasonable hope for the future because it's founded on Jesus being raised from the dead, an actual historical event. And we can have peace that passes understanding because we've got that future hope laid out for us and the forgiveness of sins that we enjoy even now and faith that overcomes the world because we know this world is ending new one lying ahead, and the joy and blessing that can fill us in Christ Jesus, that can actually spill out all the other relationships we have in this earth. Are you drifting? If so, just what currents, what currents are pulling you away from God? Because whatever they are, it's not worth it. You know, even good things by themselves can pull us away from God if they're not properly oriented. And so God speaks in his justice and he speaks in his love to both warn us and to woo us to salvation. <coughs> if you need to respond to this message, if you're already a Christian, you can pray right now for forgiveness, for reconciliation. And he's faithful and just to forgive you because that blood has been shed and you are in Christ. And there's some measure of repentance we all need, right? To pay much closer attention to that word. But if you're not a Christian, you'd like to be. We can discuss that right now. So stay